Moby Dick by Herman Melville Chapters 13 through 15 Chapter 13 Wheelbarrow Next morning, Monday, after disposing of the embalmed head to a barber for a block, I settled my own and comrade's bill, using, however, my comrade's money. The grinning landlord, as well as the boarders, seemed amazingly tickled at the sudden friendship which had sprung up between me and Queequeg, especially as Peter Coffin's cock-and-bull stories about him had previously so much alarmed me concerning the very person whom I now companied with. We borrowed a wheelbarrow, and embarking our things, including my own poor carpet-bag, and Queequeg's canvas sack and hammock, away went down to the moss, a little Nantucket packet schooner moored at the wharf. As we were going along, the people stared, not at Queequeg so much, for they were used to seeing cannibals like him in their streets, but at seeing him and me on such confidential terms. But we heeded them not, going along, wheeling the barrow by turns, and Queequeg now and then stopping to adjust the sheath on his harpoon barbs. I asked him why he carried such a troublesome thing with him ashore, and whether all whaling ships did not find their own harpoons. To this, in substance, he replied that, though what I hinted was true enough, yet he had a particular affection for his own harpoon, because it was of assured stuff, well tried in many a mortal combat, and deeply intimate with the hearts of whales. In short, like many inland reapers and mowers, who go into the farmer's meadows armed with their own scythes, though in no wise obliged to furnish them, even so Queequeg, for his own private reasons, preferred his own harpoon. Shifting the barrow from my hand to his, he told me a funny story about the first wheelbarrow he had ever seen. It was in Sag Harbor. The owners of his ship, it seems, had lent him one, in which to carry his heavy chest to his boarding-house. Not to seem ignorant about the thing, though in truth he was entirely so, concerning the precise way in which to manage the barrow, Queequeg put his chest upon it, lashes it fast, and then shoulders the barrow and marches up the wharf. Why, said I, Queequeg, you might have known better than that, one would think. Didn't the people laugh? Upon this he told me another story. The people of his island of Cocovoco, it seems, at their wedding feasts, express the fragrant water of young coconuts into a large, stained calabash, like a punch-bowl, and this punch-bowl always forms the great central ornament on the braided mat where the feast is held. Now a certain grand merchant ship once touched at Cocovoco, and its commander, uh, from all accounts a very stately, punctilious gentleman, at least for a sea captain, this commander was invited to the wedding feast of Queequeg's sister, a pretty young princess just turned of ten. Well, when all the wedding guests were assembled at the bride's bamboo cottage, this captain marches in, and being assigned the post of honor, placed himself over against the punch-bowl, and between the high priest and his majesty the king, Queequeg's father. Grace being said, for those people have grace as well as we, though Queequeg told me that unlike us, who at such times look downward to our platters, they, on the contrary, copying the ducks, glance upward to the great giver of all feasts. Grace, I say, being said, the high priest opens the banquet by the immemorial ceremony of the island, that is, dipping his consecrated and consecrating fingers into the bowl before the blessed beverage circulates. Seeing himself placed next to the priest, and noting the ceremony, and thinking himself, being captain of a ship, as having plain precedence over a mere island king, especially in the king's own house, the captain coolly proceeds to wash his hands in the punch-bowl, taking it, I suppose, for a huge finger-glass. Now, said Queequeg, what do you think now? Didn't our people laugh? At last, passage paid and luggage safe, we stood on board the schooner. Hoisting sail, it glided down the Acushnet River. On one side New Bedford rose in terraces of streets, their ice-covered trees all glittering in the clear, cold air. Huge hills and mountains of casks on casks were piled upon her wharves, and side by side the world-wandering whale-ships lay silent and safely moored at last, while from others came a sound of carpenters and coopers, with blended noises of fires and forges to melt the pitch, all betokening that new cruises were on the start, 
that one most perilous and long voyage ended only begins a second, and a second ended only begins a third, and so on, forever and for aye. Such is the endlessness, yea, the intolerableness, of all earthly effort. Gaining the more open water, the bracing breeze waxed fresh. The little moss tossed the quick foam from her bows as a young colt his snortings. How I snuffed that tartar air! How I spurned that turnpike earth, that common highway all over dented with the marks of slavish heels and hoofs, and turned me to admire the magnanimity of the sea which will permit no records. At the same foam fountain, Queequeg seemed to drink and reel with me. His dusky nostrils swelled apart. He showed his filed and pointed teeth. On, on we flew, and, our offing gained, the moss did homage to the blast, ducked and dived her bows as a slave before the sultan. Sideways leaning, we sideways darted, every rope-yarn tingling like a wire, the two tall masts buckling like Indian canes in land tornadoes. So full of this reeling scene were we, as we stood by the plunging bowsprit, that for some time we did not notice the jeering glances of the passengers, a lubber-like assembly, who marveled that two fellow-beings should be so companionable, as though a white man were anything more dignified than a whitewashed negro. But there were some boobies and bumpkins there, who, by their intense greenness, must have come from the heart and center of all verdure. Queequeg caught one of these young saplings, mimicking him behind his back. I thought the bumpkin's hour of doom was come. Dropping his harpoon, the brawny savage caught him in his arms, and by an almost miraculous dexterity and strength sent him high up bodily into the air. Then, slightly tapping his stern in mid-somerset, the fellow landed with bursting lungs upon his feet, while Queequeg, turning his back upon him, lighted his tomahawk pipe and passed it to me for a puff. "'Capting! Capting!' yelled the bumpkin, running towards that officer. "'Capting! Capting! Here's the devil!' "'Hello, you, sir!' cried the captain, a gaunt rib of the sea, stalking up to Queequeg. "'What in thunder do you mean by that? Don't you know you might have killed that chap?' "'What him say?' said Queequeg, as he mildly turned to me. "'He say,' said I, "'that you came near Killy, that man there.' pointing to the still shivering greenhorn. Gilly, <laughs> cried Queequeg, twisting his tattooed face into an unearthly expression of disdain. Ah, him bevy small fishy. Queequeg no killy so smally fishy. Queequeg killy big whale. Look you, roared the captain, I'll killy you, you cannibal, if you try any more of your tricks aboard here, so mind your eye. But it so happened just then that it was high time for the captain to mind his own eye. The prodigious strain upon the mainsail had parted the weather-sheet, and the tremendous boom was now flying from side to side, completely sweeping the entire after part of the deck. The poor fellow whom Queequeg had handled so roughly was swept overboard. All hands were in a panic, and to attempt snatching at the boom to stay it seemed madness. It flew from right to left and back again, almost in one ticking of a watch, and every instant seemed on the point of snapping into splinters. Nothing was done, and nothing seemed capable of being done. Those on deck rushed toward the bows and stood eyeing the boom as if it were the lower jaw of an exasperated whale. In the midst of this consternation, Queequeg dropped deftly to his knees, and crawling under the path of the boom, whipped hold of a rope, secured one end to the bulwarks, and then flinging the other like a lasso, caught it round the boom as it swept over his head, and at the next jerk the spar was that way trapped and all was safe. The schooner was run into the wind, and while the hands were clearing away the stern-boat, Queequeg, stripped to the waist, darted from the side with a long, living arc of a leap. For three minutes or more he was seen swimming like a dog, throwing his long arms straight out before him, and by turns revealing his brawny shoulders through the freezing foam. I looked at the grand and glorious fellow, but saw no one to be saved. The greenhorn had gone down. Shooting himself perpendicularly from the water, Queequeg now took an instant's glance around him, and seeming to see just how matters were, dived down and disappeared. A few minutes more, and he rose again, one arm still striking out, and with the other dragging a lifeless form. The boat soon picked them up. 
the poor bumpkin was restored. All hands voted Queequeg a noble trump. The captain begged his pardon. From that hour I clove to Queequeg like a barnacle. Yea, till poor Queequeg took his last long dive. Was there ever such unconsciousness? He did not seem to think that he had all deserved a medal from the humane and magnanimous societies. He only asked for water, fresh water, something to wipe the brine off. That done, he put on dry clothes, lighted his pipe, and leaning against the bulwarks, and mildly eyeing those around him, seemed to be saying to himself, "'It's a mutual joint-stock world in all meridians. We cannibals must help these Christians.'" Chapter 14 Nantucket Nothing more happened on the passage worthy of mentioning, so after a fine run we safely arrived in Nantucket. Nantucket! Take out your map and look at it. See what a real corner of the world it occupies, how it stands there, away off shore, more lonely than the Eddystone lighthouse. Look at it, a mere hillock and elbow of sand, all beach and without a background. There is more sand there than you would use in twenty years as a substitute for blotting paper. Some gamesome whites will tell you that they have to plant weeds there, that they don't grow naturally, that they import Canada thistles, that they have to send beyond seas for a spile to stop a leak in an oil cask, that pieces of wood in Nantucket are carried about like bits of the true cross in Rome, that people there plant toadstools before their house, to get under the shade in summer time, that one blade of grass makes an oasis, three blades in a day's walk a prairie, that they wear quicksand shoes, something like Laplander snowshoes, that they are so shut up, belted about, every way enclosed, surrounded, and made an utter island of by the ocean, that to their very chairs and tables small clams will sometimes be found adhering, as to the backs of sea turtles. But these extravaganzas only show that Nantucket is no Illinois. Look now at the wondrous traditional story of how this island was settled by the red men. Thus goes the legend. In olden times an eagle swooped down upon the New England coast and carried off an infant Indian in its talons. With loud laments the parents saw their child borne out of sight over the wide waters. They resolved to follow in the same direction. Setting out in their canoes, after a perilous passage, they discovered the island, and there they found an empty ivory casket, the poor little Indian's skeleton. What wonder, then, that these Nantucketers, born on a beach, should take to the sea for a livelihood? They first caught crabs and quahogs in the sand. Grown bolder, they waded out with nets for mackerel. More experienced, they pushed off in boats and captured cod and at last, launching a navy of great ships on the sea, explored this watery world, put an incessant belt of circumnavigations round it, peeped in at Bering Straits, and in all seasons and all oceans declared everlasting war with the mightiest animated mass that has survived the flood, most monstrous and most mountainous, that Himalayan salt sea mastodon, clothed with such portentousness of unconscious power, that his very panics are more to be dreaded than his most fearless and malicious assaults. And thus of these naked Nantucketers, these sea hermits, issuing from their anthill in the sea, overrun and conquered the watery world like so many Alexanders, parceling out among them the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian oceans, as the three pirate powers did Poland. Let America add Mexico to Texas and pile Cuba upon Canada. Let the English overswarm all India and hang out their blazing banner from the sun. Two-thirds of this terraqueous globe are the Nantucketers. For the sea is his. He owns it, as emperors own empires, other seamen having but a right of way through it. Merchant ships are but extension bridges, armed ones but floating forts. Even pirates and privateers, though following the sea as highwaymen the road, they but plunder other ships, other fragments of the land like themselves, without seeking to draw their living from the bottomless deep itself. The Nantucketer, he alone resides and riots on the sea. He alone, in Bible language, goes down to it in ships, to and fro ploughing it as his own special plantation. There is his home, there lies his business which a Noah's flood would not interrupt, 
though it overwhelmed all the millions in China. He lives on the sea as prairie cocks in the prairie. He hides among the waves. He climbs them as chamois hunters climb the Alps. For years he knows not the land, so that when he comes to it at last, it smells like another world, more strangely than the moon would to an earthman. With the landless gull that at sunset folds her wings and is rocked to sleep between billows, so at nightfall the Nantucketer, out of sight of land, furls his sails and lays him to his rest, while under his very pillow rush herds of walruses and whales. CHAPTER Fifteen, CHOWDER It was quite late in the evening when the little moss came snugly to anchor, and Queequeg and I went ashore, so we could attend to no business that day, at least none but a supper and a bed. The landlord of the Spouter Inn had recommended us to his cousin, Hosea Hussey, of the Tripots, whom he asserted to be the proprietor of one of the best-kept hotels in all Nantucket, and, moreover, he had assured us— that Cousin Hosea, as he called him, was famous for his chowders. In short, he plainly hinted that we could not possibly do better than try potluck at the tripots. But the directions he had given us about keeping a yellow warehouse on our starboard hand till we opened a white church to the larboard, and then keeping that on the larboard hand till we made a corner three points to the starboard, and that done, then asked the first man we met where the place was— these crooked directions of his very much puzzled us at first, especially as at the outset Queequeg insisted that the yellow warehouse, our first point of departure, must be left on the larboard hand, whereas I had understood Peter Coffin to say it was on the starboard. However, by dint of beating about a little in the dark, and now and then knocking up a peaceable inhabitant to inquire the way, we at last came to something which there was no mistaking— Two enormous wooden pots, painted black, and suspended by asses' ears, swung from the cross-trees of an old topmast, planted in front of an old doorway. The horns of the cross-trees were sawed off on the other side, so that this old topmast looked not a little like the gallows. Perhaps I was oversensitive to such impressions at the time, but I could not help staring at this gallows with vague misgiving. A sort of crick was in my neck as I gazed up to the two remaining horns. Yes, two of them, one for Queequeg and one for me. It's ominous, thinks I. A coffin, my innkeeper, upon landing in my first whaling port, tombstones staring at me in the whaleman's chapel, and here a gallows, and a pair of prodigious black pots, too. Are these last throwing out oblique hints touching Tophet? I was called from these reflections by the sight of a freckled woman with yellow hair and a yellow gown, standing in the porch of the inn under a dull red lamp swinging there, that looked much like an injured eye, and carrying on a brisk scolding with a man in a purple woolen shirt. "'Get along with ye,' she said to the man, "'or I'll be combing ye.' "'Come on, Queequeg,' said I. "'All right, there's Mrs. Hussey.' And so it turned out, Mr. Hosea Hussey being from home, but leaving Mrs. Hussey entirely competent to attend to all his affairs. Upon making known our desires for supper and a bed, Mrs. Hussey, postponing further scolding for the present, ushered us into a little room, and seating us at a table spread with the relics of a recently concluded repast, turned round to us and said, "'Clam or cod?' "'What's that about cods, ma'am?' said I, with much politeness. "'Clam or cod?' she repeated. "'A clam for supper. A cold clam. Is that what you mean, Mrs. Hussey?' says I. "'But that's a rather cold and clammy reception in the winter time, ain't it, Mrs. Hussey?' But being in a great hurry to resume scolding the man in the purple shirt, who was waiting for it in the entry, and seeming to hear nothing but the word clam— Mrs. Hussey hurried towards an open door leading to the kitchen, and bawling out, "'Clam for two! disappeared. "'Queequeg,' said I, "'do you think that we can make out a supper for us both on one clam?' However, a warm and savory steam from the kitchen served to belie the apparently cheerless prospect before us. But when that smoking chowder came in, the mystery was delightfully explained. "'Oh, sweet friends, hearken to me!' It was made of small, juicy clams, scarcely bigger than hazelnuts, mixed with pounded ship-biscuit, 
and salted pork cut up into little flakes, the whole enriched with butter and plentifully seasoned with pepper and salt. Our appetites being sharpened by the frosty voyage, and in particular Queequeg seeing his favorite fishing food before him, and the chowder being surpassingly excellent, we dispatched it with great expedition. When, leaning back a moment, and bethinking me of Mrs. Hussey's clam and cod announcement, I thought I would try a little experiment. Stepping to the kitchen door, I uttered the word, COD, with great emphasis, and resumed my seat. In a few moments, the savory steam came forth again, but with a different flavor, and in good time a fine cod chowder was placed before us. We resumed business, and, while plying our spoons in the bowl, thinks I to myself, I wonder now if this here has any effect on the head. What's that stultifying saying about chowder-headed people? But look, Queequeg, ain't that a live eel in your bowl? Where's your harpoon? Fishiest of all fishy places was the tripods, which well deserved its name, for the pots there were always boiling chowders, chowder for breakfast, and chowder for dinner, and chowder for supper, till you began to look for fish bones coming through your clothes. The area before the house was paved with clam shells. Mrs. Hussey wore a polished necklace of codfish vertebrae, and Hosea Hussey had his account books bound in superior old shark skin. There was a fishy flavor to the milk, too, which I could not at all account for, till one morning, happening to take a stroll along the beach, among some fishermen's boats, I saw Hosea's brindled cow feeding on fish remnants, and marching along the sand with each foot in a cod's decapitated head, looking very slipshod, I assure you. Supper concluded, we received a lamp, and directions from Mrs. Hussey concerning the nearest way to bed. But as Queequeg was about to precede me up the stairs, the lady reached forth her arm, and demanded his harpoon. She allowed no harpoon in her chambers. "'Why not?' said I. "'Every true whaleman sleeps with his harpoon. But why not?' "'Because it's dangerous,' says she. "'Ever since young Stiggs, coming from that unfortunate viage of his, when he was gone four years and a half, with only three barrels of ile, was found dead in my first floor back with his harpoon in his side. Ever since then I allow no boarders to take sich dangerous weapons in their rooms at night. So, Mr. Queequeg, for she had learned his name, I will just take this here iron and keep it for you till morning. But the chowder, clam or cod to-morrow for breakfast, men? Both, says I, and let's have a couple of smoked herring by way of variety.' 